talk about why it is important for security people to make sure that we empower developers to work securely from the beginning. And I will tell you why, but first let's start with this word, DevSecOps. Who, who have heard of this word? Hopefully a lot of, yes, a lot of you, thank you. But who practices DevSecOps nowadays? That's not very much, unfortunately, but at, le at least a few of you do. One of the things is, let's go to the basics, DevOps. Everybody knows what DevOps is? Like, yes, yes, amazing. DevOps, we try to tear down the wall between the developers and the old-fashioned operations organization, and the, the, like put them together. So we can be better, faster, and stronger. And basically, as a DevOps team, you own the stuff you create. So once you create something, it goes into production, you need to take care of it. That is basically DevOps, owning the stuff that you create and not throwing it over the wall and say to the operation guys like, good luck. But there's a gap. Security is not on the mindset of the traditional developer, nor the operation folks. But we know that if security comes at the end of the software development life cycle, SDLC, however you might call it, it might mean that we are either already too late or we need to do a lot of rework. So we need to empower these developers or DevOps engineers, as you might call them. But first, this is me. I am Brian, I'm a developer advocate, which means I still develop. I'm a developer, but I do also do these talks and educate developers and create workshops. And I practice to do make, making sure that people get that DevOps or DevSecOps mindset. I'm a Java champion, so mainly my, my work is in the Java ecospace. Uh, Business Insider just named me top 21 developers shaping tech. I have no clue what that means, but it sounds important. And I co-lead the DevSecOps um, community, which focuses on that whole DevSecOps mindset. I work for Sneak, by the way, which is a company that does security tooling. However, let's go into what the actual problem is. Let's strip it down to a few things. First of all, let me take you on a journey, say 10 years ago. I work, I am from the Netherlands, Peba, that is like the petit peu French I know. And um, I worked at banks and insurance companies, like these old fashioned companies. And at that point, and also government agencies, like 10 years ago, we deployed three times a year. So we created a bunch of stuff, and then there was enough time to test all of that before going to production. Nowadays, look at e-commerce. We try to speed up things. We try to, might even do three times a day if possible. But how about security? Can we still pen test old-fashionedly if we deploy three times a day? That's pretty much impossible. But the other thing is there's a lack of security over the whole mindset. A developer thinks about developing stuff, creating stuff, making new stuff, making sure that it works. At the end comes the security team, siloed, just, we, that, just like we had with dev and ops 10 years ago or five years ago or many years ago. So we need to make sure that the security thoughts, the security mindset is in the mind of the developers, just like with scalability, maintainability, uh, readability of the code, we also need to make sure that we start at the beginning. Because we're on the same team, and if we don't do that, we have to make sure that the customer data that is in our systems is still protected, and we are on the same team. But what happens is, if I develop my stuff, then at the end of that life cycle, one of the security team members comes with me with a big list of defects. An audit trail, like, go fix. You know what that feels like? I worked hard on that. And then you have friction. And then you have more friction. And then the developers start to hate the security people. And the security people start to hate the developers because they're just a bunch of cowboys. And then we get from bad to worse. So, okay, how bad is that situation? I see some laughter, so you might understand it already, like, yeah, that's happening. Well, let's look at what we call the iceberg. 
this is the top of the iceberg. That is the code that your developers, or maybe you, who was a developer over here? Or was a developer, like, in a past life? It's also cool. Okay, then you understand. This is the code you worked on hard, blood, sweat, and tears on your own code. Great. Only the code that you create, the custom code, is just 10, maybe 20% of the binary that you put into production. Right? I mean, and we can do a lot. Of, we are proud of that code. We do code reviews. We make sure that our code is readable, code good quality, and all that kind of stuff. Absolutely marvelous. But if I create code, and this is a snippet of Java code, and you don't even need to read it, but there's a security defect in it. Maybe you see it right away. Maybe not. It's not the issue. But the problem is that over here, I input a parameter, and without proper sanitization, I output it right away in my web. Uh, endpoint or in my in my in my HTML page because the response writer directly gets the parameter a classic type 1 cross-site scripting problem and Well most developers nowadays are kind of aware of it ish to it, but you still not it's not a subject in university But okay, we might catch this either with some tooling or with key developers if we actually do proper code reviews But that is just 10% so you cover 10% good for you now the rest, because under the surface of that iceberg, like under the waterline, you know an iceberg is just this big, but underwater that's like huge. Let's start with this part. The open source packages, frameworks, and all that stuff that you implement, that you use with your package manager like NPM for Node.js or Maven for, for Java or PyPI for Python. You're using that stuff to build your stuff, like you, to build your own business logic on top of and that's for a good reason i don't want as a developer i don't want to do the easy things like creating a connection to a database if a library can do that for me done i don't have to pay attention to that i can focus on the smart stuff that's what i like as a developer so i create a ton, i use a ton of libraries or a framework and we know that a framework brings in another library brings in another library and brings in another library several layers deep are you actually aware of how much that is how much code do you adopt just because your developer read something on a blog post or on Stack Overflow like, hey, just import this, do this, it works. What does that imply? Well, basically 80 to 90% of the code that is in your code, ba code base is borrowed code. So probably have heard of this problem. 2017, back in the United States of America, there was once a company called Equifax. 2017, I will not go into the company, I will go into the problem. The problem was that they were using an outdated version of Apache Struts, Apache Struts 2, and there was a problem in there. There was a defect in the framework, not in the custom code of the developers, no, in the framework they were using. Point is, people could get into the system, snoop around for months, and over 140 million customers were compromised. On the other hand, um, at the point when people got in, let me just give you the timeline shortly. On March 7, 2017, the problem in the library was found. There was a patch. May 12, so a month later, the hack at Equifax started. They were in for over 76 days before Equifax noticed and patched it. So the point is, Many software developers and many software developer companies are focusing on features. Get this new feature out because that makes an advantage for us towards our competitors. And what's already in production is already there. Now focus on the new stuff. And there's what the problem is. And that's because they were using a library that was outdated, that was already a newer version, and that could have fixed the problem. So far, the damage is over $2 billion, which is a lot. And it will probably get more because well, problems with your branding and stuff. Now we'll, I will do a tricky part because I need to do a bit of live coding with the handheld mic. Bear with me. So I will go into an application. You see an application here. It's a Java application we wrote with that same Apache Struts library. The application is not important because it's in the plumbing, I told you. So like a real hacker, I'm not a real hacker, trust me. I go into my terminal. And I will enlarge this, watch.
and you're still probably like, what is this? Well, let me explain this to you. First, refresh this. This. This is what we need to focus on. What I can do, a web browser does a request and you'll get something back. Let's do this like old school at a black terminal. I will use curl. And I will do a curl command using this header. And this is a content type. Normally it's something like plain text or HTML. Who recognizes this content type? Nobody? It is an invalid content type. It is not real. What happens if you use this invalid content type, you go into an exceptional flow in Apache Struts. In that exceptional flow, for some reason, you are allowed to use OGNL, which is the object graph navigational language, and you can forget that. It's an expression language, and I can call certain functions, certain methods, and I can create new objects in memory. And that's where things go wrong, because I create a new process builder, so I start up a new process. I give this process the bash. Equally, I give it a terminal. And I feed this bash an arbitrary command. Let's do this. I'm using that header I showed you, and now I substitute the word command for the word env, E-N-V, which shows me the environment variables, just a basic Linux command. And let's not do this on local host because that is way too easy. Let's do this on the application, and this runs on Heroku, a cloud provider. So I just move this away, and I will just do a GET request on that application on Heroku, and look what happens. You see this part? It gives me all sorts of status information, but I now have the environment variables on that Heroku pod that is there in the cloud. But if I can call the environment variables, I might can see what, what files there are. I, I'm able to create files. I'm creating, crea able to create a file with some content, a script. I can call that script like two days later. Good luck you finding out what happened. Going through your logs, it's painful. And you see over here that, for instance, I can see where the Java home is. Well, it's not really interesting, but you see that I can do arbitrary code execution. And you see the Java home here, right? How much time do you have? I have lots of time, amazing. So let's, let's right away do, do something with that. So I have the application here, and I sign up, and I will just explain the application in a second. Let's choose a password, one, two, three, four, five, six, because I work at a security company. Don't do this at home, folks. No, don't, don't save this. Don't, please don't, please don't. So I, this is a to-do list, and I cre can create to-dos like, and I do something, you see this? I do something like nerdy with eat pie with a pie sign. Funny. Let's put it somewhere in 9070 and give it a high priority because, well, by now I'm hungry. And what you see over here is, and I can enlarge this for you a bit, you see that the pi sign is now translated into the ASCII representation. And we use the native to ASCII function, which is, which is there in Java on the JDK. It's a file there somewhere on the JDK we can use. Interesting. Next step. I can upload files. And I just, it's not just files, I can upload zip files. But what if my zip file looks like this? You see this? This zip file contains two files. A good.txt, which is just a regular file, good.txt, and a second file. And the file name is this. Dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, all the way down to the root, basically a path traversal, slash app slash dot jdk, I got that from the environment variables, slash bin slash native to ASCII the place where the native to ASCII is, uh, file is located on the JDK. In this case, on the JDK on my Heroku instance. So what I'm trying to do is, I'm unzipping this file. 
And if it works, we just overwrote an existing file on the JDK, which is there natively. Let's do this. Let's choose a file. I never thought this would be hard to do it with one hand. I have respect for people programming with one hand, absolutely. I uploaded it, and you see that good.tax is in my public folder. But what happened to the other one? Let's give it a date, doesn't matter. Because now every label goes to native to ASCII, but will be translated to uh, Mwaha, gotcha. Because I overwrote the native to ASCII file. The reason for this is there is no unzip function in Java. We can look at the zip entries, we can see what byte stream is in there. However, we cannot just unzip. There's a reason for that, because you need to be aware what you're doing. But what, do, what, what am I using? A library. And that library didn't sanitize the input name and didn't just cut away the dot dot slashes. So it just uses the dot dot slashes, didn't look at the canonical path, so basically where it would end up, and it ends up outside of the scope of my application. I overwrote something in the native JDK, and now my whole application had does something differently, which I didn't expect. Because I'm using the wrong version of a library, and I could have avoided this, if I would just scan my application and Let me just look at my, I, I imported the, 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 the Git repo for this application. And if I would go to my, my projects, and I'm using my own tool just to show you what you should have been doing, and not specifically with my tool, but in general. And let's look at zip. This is actually exactly the problem we had. And if I would upgrade it 112 to 113, I was already there, but just like with Apache Struts, I didn't pay attention what was yet in production, and I just looked at new features, because if it ain't broken, don't touch it. And that happens a lot in big companies. Let's continue. So, if this is the binary that you put into production, how much of it is your code? Well, we already agreed that it's 10%, right? So, basically this. How should we care about that big yellow part? I believe we should care the, at, at the same amount as that small purple part in the middle. But are we doing that? Is your development team doing that? Or once a dependency is in, it never goes out. Don't answer this, please. I don't want to know, but just take this information. Open source usage has exploded over the last decade or so, and for a good reason. But remember that open source is not more or less secure than your own code. I mean, I'm an open source developer. I, I contribute to open source packages, major things, but also everybody makes mistakes and they get fixed. But once a package is used widely, there are a potential large pool of victims. So we should be taking care of this and not just, it works, let's, let's look at something new and only work on features. Some statistics. New packages created by ecosystem per year. We see that the yellow line is NPM. They are the clear winner. In 2019, over 1 million packages. They created like in total over 1 million packages. So if you look for a package, you will find a dozen of them. Which one to pick? Because every year new vulnerabilities get identified in your open source. In every single ecosystem. On top of what was already there. And most of these problems are in the transitive dependencies because I'm picking a package or a library, but that means that it includes a lot of other stuff. And deep down below three, four, five levels, there might be a tiny little issue. You got me. So it's not just looking at your packages manu manually, but know, knowing what you implicitly include. We asked open source maintainers how confident they are about their own security knowledge. We did this in our annual state of open source security survey and report. 63% says, well, I'm kind of okay with my security knowledge. And then again, we do code reviews for our own code, but we trust kinda okay blindly. That's weird. Also ask people like, how do you find out about vulnerabilities? 
and 27% says, I probably won't. And that scares me. So we need, there is a large gap between the development organization and, say, DevOps teams and security. Who is responsible for security? Who thinks that, that it is purely the security team? Who thinks that? Thank you. Nobody. Who thinks it's developers that need to take care of security? At least a few of them. Think it, is, it is a shared responsibility. Let's be honest. But if you look at the software, and then I mean just all the application, 85% of the people think that secure, the developers need to take their fair share. But there's also infrastructure. And that is interesting. What do we mean by infrastructure? Let's go back to our, our, our iceberg. The next level. I see people making pictures. I will publish the slides. Don't worry. Third level, like under league water, containers. Who have heard of Docker? Who've used Docker or in their organization using Docker have used whatever or any other container is also good, like Podman containers. I'm good with that. But let's, let's focus on Docker containers because that is the most widely used. A Docker container is built on top of something else. The first thing in a Docker file that you do is say a statement from Ubuntu or from Debian or from Node.js. We, this is 2019, I did a research on Docker containers. I downloaded the 10 most popular freely available base images from Docker Hub and just with the latest tag. These were the amount of vulnerabilities I found out. That means that every single one of these 10 had vulnerabilities. The problem is if you look at, for instance, the larger one, the Node.js package, the latest one is based on yet another package. In this case, it was Debian Jesse or something like that. So a full blown operating system, I bring in my, bring into my, in my container just to run my tiny little Node.js micro service. Does that make sense? Not really. But what does it imply? Because I have a full operating system that brings in a bunch of binaries and all these binaries do something. And they might not be directly attackable, but there might be a chain somewhere that I connect the dots and they play a part in an attack. So choosing your base image right, choosing your base image carefully is essential if you want to have either a small Docker container, but also a secure Docker container. In that same survey, state of open source security, we asked people, how do you scan your Docker images for operating system vulnerability? And 50% 50 50 says, we don't. Then we asked them, like, how do you find out about new vulnerabilities once your the, the, the container is already deployed? Almost half of them says, don't know. I probably won't. And again, that is scary. So let's do some more fun stuff. Exit. Yes, thank you. So let's go to, I show, I show you that application, that Java application, right? You have to trust me that this runs in, the same application runs in a container. And I can set up the whole container and show you the Docker file, but I don't have time for that, unfortunately. However, it runs on localhost 8080, and this is the same application, but I didn't get the CSS running, so it's unstyled. But this is the same application. Again, I do not have to touch the application, because what I'm going to do is, there is, in the container I'm using, there is a problem, an arbitrary code execution again. And this one is in a Tomcat container. I'm using Tomcat to run this application. And for instance, it was possible to upload a JSP, Java server page file, to the server via a specially crafted request. This JSP could then be requested and any code contained could be executed by the server. Nice. Exploit database, my biggest friend. So let's go into the exploit database and see what we have here. Well, it's basically a Python script. Cool. So let's look what they have. So I'm just executing somebody else's code. I didn't make it up myself. It can do two things. First, I'm going to do a check, and that check shows this JSP that tries to inject that, that JSP. And it does just a Java output line with all, with all A's. Nothing really special. 
just to show you that it's not there, poc.jsp is not available. But if I do this, if I just point this one out, mm, this is the good one, yes. Hmm, one second. Ah, uh, my internet connection is down. I'm sorry, I can't show you. I'm really sad. I will try one more time. The source is container. No, unfortunately it doesn't, doesn't build my container. Never mind. But what it can do, like in the second one, and I will just show you the code and you have to believe me that, that, that what is happening actually works. You can try it at home. Is I can insert a script and that's basically a form. And that form contains a field with a submit button. But the interesting part is this. Every argument I have and I submit, I get the runtime and I execute that thing in the runtime. So I basically create a web shell for myself and without touching the application, I am able to do all sorts of things depending on what credentials I have. Do you know what credentials a Docker container by default has? Who knows? By default, a Docker container runs as root. So if I'm do not doing anything, I'm not giving it a sp specific user, I'm running every single thing with this web shell as root, which gives me, which gives me superpowers. I can look into there, I can execute thing again, I can create a script, I can do all sorts of nasty things because that container is still running. So it has connections to, for instance, a database. So you see, it's yet another attack factor. Going back to my slide deck, always interesting. Brings me to the last part of my iceberg, at the top, at the bottom, basically. We have infrastructure as code. Basically, it's not one container that you put into production. It's a bunch of containers. So you're using, for instance, Kubernetes or a Terraform to make sure that the orchestration of these containers is done well. When, when, when one container, maybe you need, you need two instances of, two pods, or maybe if one goes down, you want to bring a new one up. Like these kind of things you want to arrange in a configuration. And you guessed already, you can make mistakes in that as well. That is the last part. So code, open source, containers, and your infrastructure as code. If I run my cluster fully as root and everybody can, can access anything, then that's yet another thing you can exploit without touching the actual code. Interesting. But what is the solution? Let's go to the solution. I saw, showed you what the problems are. The solution consists of three things. Culture, process, and tooling. Let's go to the culture part. Think about it. I already told you that developers and, 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 and security are a bit of their, I would say enemies, but they don't, they don't like each other if we keep going doing the things like we did. And we have different KPIs. As a developer, I want to build things. As an operations person, I want to make sure that things are easily scalable and deployable. Management wants me to deliver and wants to make money of that thing. But if my manager pushes me just to deliver and I don't have time to go to all my code and get rid of my technical debt, I will take shortcuts because that's what I get measured on. As security, they want to make sure that we're not getting breached like I showed you. Hmm. That collides. So we need to make sure that we are on the same page. That we, as a developer, we think of security from the beginning. As managers, we give our development team and the security team the needs that they can collaborate. We make sure that they do discuss things with each other instead of saying no or yes. You know what I mean? Then we have process. The worst thing you can do is implement new process. Nobody wants that, nobody. 
look at how you develop software now. And maybe we can integrate security in the way you're building software now. Saying we need to create a, if you're not having a CI pipeline, for instance, we need to create a CI pipeline and we need to create a gate at the end. And then software developers say, yeah, do that. I will just deploy it that way. So that doesn't work. Let's look at what you're doing now and adapt it in such a way that we can input security from the beginning. And then you have tooling. Pick the tooling in such a way that it fits your process. Just saying, deploy it over there, and if all tests are green, you can push it to production. You know what the first thing is, what I would do? See how I can ignore the test, make sure that they're green, and I can still push whenever I want. Because I need to be fast, I don't care about that. I'm even, I don't have any clue what the security people mean. And there lies the problem. One of the solutions is creating a security champion program. One of the solutions. I'm not saying the solution, but I will briefly go into a security uh, champion program. What does it mean? Well, we need to bridge that gap between developers and security. So we have one security team and many, many, many development teams because we have a new product or a new feature. Let's spin up a new team. But how do we scale security? Still that same team, siloed. What did we do with DevOps? We glued them together. So what we can do is give one of the developers, and it needs to be a developer, make sure that he is security aware, he or she, sorry. Make sure that that developer is security aware, is security agnostic. So that can be your, your vocal point towards the rest of the team. If in my team, a team needs to be autonomous, or that's what we want. But if I have question, I don't want to go all the way up to the security team. That doesn't make sense. It takes time, and I need to push today because my manager, I told you the story. So basically, this is what we tend to achieve. And that is hard. It's not an easy thing. But if we can do this, we can scale. That means if we have somebody in that team that is a developer by heart, but is security aware, and we have that eventually in every team, we can just get the security folks, champions together, say why we want to do this, get a discussion going, and push that to the team and make sure that it's implemented as best as possible. And then I hear you say, yes, I'm not going to try that. That is hard. Absolutely. But I will give you a few things what you should do in the security champion program. First of all, it needs to be developer-focused. As a security team, I don't want to say, these are the rules, comply, good luck. No. As a security team, we need to talk to the developers. We need to talk to that, the, that developer and see, like, okay, what is the problem you are facing? And how can I help? What are your pain points? What are your needs? And what do you want out of this program? And I would suggest to make sure that people volunteer for that security program. And then I hear you think, <laughs> yeah, volunteer, sure. We'll get to that later. So it needs to be developer fo focused, not just saying do this, make sure we're at zero vulnerabilities, and then you can pass. We need to have executive sponsorship. So from the top down, we need to make sure that the CTO and the CISO from the beginning are into this. If one of them is not, it will not work because he will push down like, no, our KPIs are getting things done. But if the CTO and the CISO are okay with this and say, yeah, let's do this. And also the director levels and the VP levels are there. Then we can start to create a culture that we want. Teams need to be autonomous. That's what we want again, and that's what we need to do. So as a security team, you need to find, you don't need to be, you don't want to be too strict, but you can give them guardrails. Like in between these boundaries, the team can decide what to do. And that will probably not get you to zero. But every security win at this point is a security win. So if I can say every vulnerability that is um, located w uh, with a score under five, if you look at the CVSS database, or every low vulnerability that you can uh, argue that it's not directly vulnerable, you can safely ignore. 
And then you'll give them balance. Okay, that gives me some air. That gives me some space. Let's focus on the high or critical vulnerabilities first. And don't stop until everything is done. No, just get things going. So these clear, guard, clear, clear guardrails are important, but also the tooling that empowers them. If you just have tooling that say, there is a problem here, go fetch, that doesn't work. If you have tooling that gives you the opportunity how to fix things, that is interesting. Coaching and mentoring. In the security team, a security champion should have a point within the security team, a coach, a mentor, a mentor. If I cope as a security champion, I cope with a problem within the team or I don't have the answers, I go to my mentor and he's like, okay, maybe we should do it like this. It may not be the 100% solution, but at least we got what we want now or we are better than before. And we get there, baby steps. So they need to be guided. It is not just here, you've got the presentation and just do what I say. That doesn't work again because every situation is different. So mentoring, Coaching is important and make sure that there is a discussion because if people discuss with you, they're at least thinking of it. They're at least agnostic that security is an important thing. If they say, no, we cannot do this because whatever, get into that discussion, let them talk and let them see if you can counter that or get in the middle of it. And then the most important part, rewards and recognition. Instead of saying, this is wrong, go fix, just look at, for instance, hey, we had 10 security issues on the backlog. This team in this sprint solved eight of them. And make sure that's visible for the whole country, up, uh, uh, whole country, whole company, up to sea level. Because then you get like, oh, this is a good thing for promotion and, 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 my, and, my, uh, and my, my ladder to get up. And then you will probably get other teams to like, okay, this is the way to get more money, to get paid. So you see, promotion and recognition works better than saying no. We don't wanna have gates or as minimal as possible. But if we can say like, hey, you're doing a good job. And let's see how many they did. Or that was a critical vulnerability and they solved this in within two days. Impressive. And then you're like, I wanna be that impressive person as well. I wanna be that superhero. Of course, it's not that simple, but you get my point. Then we get to tooling. Fortunately, our company gives tooling. And the tooling is not like for the code, we have sneak code. And sneak code looks at your code and gives you not only the pointer like, hey, this is cross-site scripting. No, we also give you a possible solution. Same holds for sneak open source. You're looking at your dependencies, seeing what, what, what we have and maybe we can fix that. Maybe there is a newer version that doesn't have that dependencies. Because that empowers the developer, like, oh, okay, that's an easy fix. It's a minor, uh, minor update, probably won't a break API. I will do it. Win. Container, looking at the base image and seeing what kind of base image we want. Maybe the base image we want works, but has the problem, and we can show that again. And we can show how to fix it. And same for the infrastructure as code. So. I called all four things, check. But the point is, it's not just tooling. It's making sure that that tooling is implemented at every stage of your SDLC and how your developers want to use it. I am a person, I like the terminal. So on my local machine, I'm scanning my application on a terminal, like sneak test. I'm using, of course, my own, my own stuff. Some people like it to have it in the IDE. Why not provide it both? Like if the one wants it in the IDE and the other one wants it in the terminal. If they do it on their local machine, it's already caught early, just like unit tests. If the functionality is not there, you won't ship it. So if it's not secure, I probably won't commit it to the Git repository. But I also connect my Git repository to tooling that scans, if you have a Git repository. Same holds for your CI pipeline, but don't put a hard gate in that. I'm against the hard gate. Some people want it, some people don't. But once you deployed it, make sure that you keep monitoring it. So what we can do, for instance, we can do a sneak monitor and that takes like, hey, what was the code at that point? What were the dependencies? What is the base image? And what was your Kubernetes file? And if we scan that on a daily base, you get daily reports or daily pings like, hey, nothing is wrong, nothing is wrong, or something is wrong and we have a fix for you. And now I'm like, okay, that's easy. Just deploy it again, 
done, fixed. So that's how you empower developers, but only if they want to. So we say shift left. You heard that, that thing, right? Uh, shift, you have, we need to shift left. It's, it's a mantra. I hate it because shifting left is not enough. There is no left in a continuous process. Software development is not a start and an end. It is continuous. So look at how the process works for you because software is never done. It's n there's always maintenance. There's always new features we want to add. So make sure that we do this in the way that you work now. We empower developers so we can enable the security team to be secure from the beginning. This was it. I'm not sure how much time I have for questions. Not that long, I guess. But if you have questions, we have a booth over here. And if you want to know about the product, please go to F29. Talk to, talk to the people who have more insights on how the tools work. And if you have questions, you can ask them either now or feel free to ask them on the booth or, well, ping me by email, Twitter, or whatever is convenient for you. Thank you for your attention, and I hope you enjoy the remaining parts of free. Thanks. <laughs> so for now, are there any questions? That means I'm either super clear or you agree, agree or disagree with me completely. And if you disagree with me completely, I will urge you to go come to the booth and we can have a discussion about that because I want to make that gap between you and me a bit smaller. Thanks again.